Well, welcome to the 20th anniversary Remembrance Show. Uh, we're pretty glad uh, so many people are willing to attend this afternoon, uh, worshiping and remembering the way things used to be, the way they were. <laughs> and I think this will be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to go through some slides. Uh, it's going to be fairly fast-paced. Moreover, it's going to be improv. Apparently, there are a lot more slides in there than yesterday, and I have no idea <laughs> what we're going to see. So what I'd like to do is I would like to ask anybody that uh, can chime in and identify a person or that remembers something to please uh, say something, and I'll stop and maybe I'll respond. I have a script here, and I'll try, but I've never been good at following one. There we go. All right. Peace Lutheran Church, Pond Springs School. On, here we go down memory lane. On September 24, 1972, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. 1972, the first Sunday worship service was held under the direction of Bill Norman at the Pond Springs Elementary School cafeteria. <coughs> Peace's quick change tradition started here since we had to create a place of worship every Sunday at the setup and take down. Will everyone stand who worshiped at the Pond Springs School? Is there anybody here that took my word? <laughs> That's amazing. After six months, about six months uh, later, in uh, April 1973, the first congregational meeting was held with the congregation result congregation resolving to organize, apply for membership in the Southern District of the ELC as a mission church, subsidized by the Synod. The members voted to name the church Peace. However, the ALC preferred the acronym, and I'll try, Alpha Tawoa, which, <laughs> this is for real, which stands for a Lutheran mission for the area northwest of Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is this Chuck? Uh, this is someone needs to recognize. Does anybody recognize this? That's a goblin. That's a table. It's like a circle. Baptism. Baptism. Is this a baptism on boom? Bradford, Chris Bradford. This is Chuck Judge. While visiting one Sunday, he noticed a piano player was <clears throat> for the service was using only one hand. <laughs> And uh, he volunteered to play with two hands and became our first music director. He also actually a very creative guy. I remember we came to the church a little later, but he'd written a songbook and had some original music. It was quite unique. We um, used his organ. He brought his organ in. Is that right? His organ. All the organ. Amazing. Uh, in, in September, of, actually. This quick change stuff and everything, we'll talk about it when we get to the other part of the, when we get to the church of this bill. But, you know, you had to set up and take down every Sunday. In September of 1973, the state charter was signed and approved with 55 people becoming charter members of the fledgling church. Charter Sunday was September 23rd, 1973. Is anybody here a charter member? Stand up. Uh, yeah. Can you identify the, what's wrong with this picture? No. <laughs> Can you identify, does anybody identify this picture? Who's this picture? Oh, nice. oh, those are the the animals you made, right? Uh, <clears throat> services continued at the Pond Springs School. At a meeting on August 7, 1974, 
The members voted to purchase property along the Baron 620. There was nothing out here. <laughs> Can anybody identify that? <laughs> I know what that is. All too well. <laughs> That's when we used to services at the old church. That, if I'm not mistaken, is a receiver deal for aircraft landing at Robert Mueller. No, it's for Houston. For Houston. Houston. And Pastor John used to be there and you'd hear clear for takeoff. <laughs> by the early peace members such as Pastor Norman's uh, house for Lenten worship and members' homes for council meetings and frequent services by the, uh, by the lake. <laughs>
Mother's Day Out program was started the same year as a service, the rapidly, uh, the rapidly growing community, to service the rapidly growing community with the leadership of Eileen Quill, Lila Eli, and Patty Thomas. Patty Lubin. Patty Lubin. It says Thomas here. Yeah. All right. Well, we're just trying to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna Beike joined Peace in 1975 as our first and only so far intern. Peace extended a call to Pastor John Brolick to serve as his third pastor on October 19, 1979. Where's Pastor John? Right here. Hi. Hey. Continued growth of peace and in the wait a minute, yeah, okay, in the surrounding community brought many new members and necessitated the expansion of the facility. I want to comment on that. This was the only church I'd ever been to that had a pulpit on wheels. <laughs> this was a multi-purpose room, and uh, it was, I guess, from all those setups and takedowns at Pond Spring. You know, you just kind of have to. Rolling things around. Okay. <laughs> what? Same chairs. Same chairs. Same chairs. <laughs> Not so long. Some to be replaced, right? <laughs> Continued growth of peace in the surrounding community brought many new members and necessitated the expansion of the facility. An education building was, was erected next to the Ministry Center, with all labor being supplied by the members of peace.
been there out of some throat. Expect Big Bird to walk through the door. The Hill Country Community Ministries was founded in 1982 with Peace being a charter member. Our representative was Marty King. Marty's not here. A Boy Scout troop and explorer post was organized and with peace as its sponsoring organization. Tom Wynn was instrumental in maintaining the Scout troop's activities for many years. How many years? How many years? Uh, seven years with the explorer post and the, uh, the Scout troop actually was in uh, operation for over ten. Scout troop ten, explorer seven. All right. Well, let's give this a minute. Membership growth in 1984 caused Peace to expand the Sunday services to early and late. That year, the senior youth group went off to Denver for their first chance to attend a national youth event under the sponsorship of Nancy and Les Foot. The rapid growth of the community and Peace led to a building fund drive to greatly expand the church facilities and implement the 1983 plan. In rapid succession, the building committee recommended, received approval, and acted on the plan. And uh, the, <clears throat> we have a chart which summarizes the events after that. It's called the Walk in the Wilderness. And uh, we're going to bring that up here. We need lights. We need lights. Chuck, Fred. turn the lights on for you. It was, a, it was a tough time. Sometimes the best laid plans don't work. And uh, what's fascinating to me about that is that out of that, what we're calling the walk in the wilderness, there are now three churches, not one. So really, if our original plans were to work out, there would be one church. But today there are three churches. I don't know what we've got here. So, sometimes it's interesting. This is the one. All right, here we go. <laughs> this, uh, uh, was there originally a parsonage here when this place started? When we yes. started? Yes. Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> All right, well, there was a parsonage here. That was when it first began. And this is the building you saw built, the big building. And then our, we originally bought some land, 620 Oaks, to build on. And we had the problems building on that land. And we purchased a patch road property. And uh, then all the real estate crunch and everything hit us. And we met for a long time at St. Thomas More. And then finally, we settled on this building. And when we moved into this building, we were Pastor John, it was just just the metal. But it felt real good. The gymnasium. It was a gymnasium. We're standing over the trampoline chair. <laughs> and uh, but then after a while it uh, you know, after a while it didn't feel so good. And what you're looking at in this building again was done by members of this church. Everything here you see, this pulpit was built by Doug Kelly. And uh, all, all, all the stuff, this was just a metal building. It's amazing. And this is when, when we uh, developed uh, the 40-40 rule. People would work 40 hours that week and 40 hours at this church. <laughs> That's the truth, too. And it was a hurricane. But it was a great time. It was a wonderful time. And finally, people were just exhausted. And we kind of reached the end of the road, and the Lord is so wonderful. A guy walked through the door. He's a Baptist. He said, uh, I'm going to paint your church. All you have to do is buy the paint, and I'm going to finish everything else. And we just didn't have it anymore. And this guy walked through the door out of the blue and says, this is my mission in life. And then one day, he came through here, and it was essentially done. Isn't that amazing? It's wonderful. So anyway, that's how we got here. Now oh, let's see. Uh, I've kind of jumped around here a little bit. We'll catch up. All right. Go ahead. Give some pictures there. Tom, what are the other two churches? Uh, the uh, the other church is the Bible church that bought the Hatch property. They never would have been able to afford the ground except for that time. And uh, what's the second church? Church of the Hills. Church of the, church of the Hills. Oh, no, Church of the Savior. Church of the Savior. So... It is an hour that looks kind of me. It's a good thing. Okay. Is this the original? That was the 620 Oaks property that we really wish we. I mean, that's Hatch Road. Right. 
That's Antwerp. Right now we're at uh, All right. The original 620 property was sold in 1984 after the purchase of lots in 620 Oaks and along Hatch Road. The last worship at the original 620 uh, site was on September 22nd, 1985. Carpet. I remember that carpet. 
1987, the members decided that the gymnastics interior was too much of a worship distraction and invoked a major renovation plan, which we've just looked at and described. But, and I said the work was led by Don and Karen Thorson, uh, Fred Herber, I would say, and Doug Kelly, and probably a bunch of other people that I've forgotten about. Uh, in January, <coughs> oh, wait a minute. You're supposed to sing again. <laughs> Christian message, and he made all the puppets 
He, he wrote all the scripts. It, it was just amazing what that kid could do. And he's just a wonderful young man. And the, my favorite one, I want to know how many of you remember the head puppet? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't explain it. You had to see it. <laughs> but it was just great. Just great. Sunny day, sweeping up, rides away. <laughs> pastor Nolan Sockabeel was called to be assistant pastor in January 1990 to especially help with out outreach programs. He helped in program planning and worked at Peace for over a year before accepting a call in Vernon. Pastor Nolan here? Yeah. 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 The youth, 21 strong, attended the National Youth Convention uh, in Dallas in July 1991, sponsored by the Neelys and Jack Rebell. Presently, our youth are working toward the next national uh, convention in Atlanta. Uh, pastor Lucinda Zesch was called to be part-time assistant pastor in July 1991 to primarily help with youth uh, programs and development. Uh, these are kids. Who wants to say something about these? <laughs> Say what? Two years ago, Vacation Bible School, the um, sixth and seventh graders <coughs> went and did service projects throughout the uh, community. And that's where some of these pictures are from. Community Habitat um, for Humanity, Trinity Lutheran, all different places like that. And that's Pastor Lucinda, who I didn't introduce. Stand up, please. <laughs> <laughs>
and he just uh, beat the notes into you. That's <laughs> all I can say. Uh, half the people, or most of the people in the choir can't read music. I just do my software, I don't know anything. And uh, he's really kind of uh, turned a, a, a rough uh, piece of coal into a gem. <laughs> Where's Kevin? Stand up.
I'll be there next year. <laughs> I'd like to ask uh, Pastor Figueroa and all your members to stand up. Thanks a lot. This is a good group, and I'm glad everything turned out real well. See you. 